Amen. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for the life that you've given us, Father God. We thank you that through your son, Jesus Christ, we have life and we have life more abundantly, Father God. We thank you for this wonderful week that you've taken us through, Father God. We thank you for your blessings, your protection, your mercy, and your grace and uh, been following us, Father God. And we just thank you this morning. We have an opportunity, Lord, that we've been with you all week, Father God, individually, but now we get to come together corporately and hear your word and fellowship with one another, Father God, and with you. Father God, praying that things will be said today, Father God, just be a confirmation of what you've been speaking to your people all week long, Father God. We just thank you. Father God, we just lay aside every weight and every sin that would keep us from hearing your word this morning, Father God. We confess our sins before you, Father. I ask you to forgive us for every sin and every trespass that we've done and even forgive those who have sinned and trespassed against us, Father God. We pray that your Holy Spirit will speak through me, Father God, and silence everything else, Father God. We thank you for your word that we have prepared. And Father God, we thank you for the revelation that comes through your Holy Spirit. Father God, let your word be life to us, Father God, and as it continue to transform us. Give us a revelation of Father God this morning, what you will have us to hear in order that we may be continually perfected in your word and by your word and through your spirit and one another, Father God, as we fellowship. Bless us today, Father. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. Pray that my sound is good. Sip of water. I had something new, but um, I was reminded by the Holy Spirit and a few other people in the body to go back and finish um, what we was talking about. Do our life display the characteristics of God in his heart that we ended up time before last? And we ended up on the scripture. We have one main scripture we're going to go on today. <clears throat> and it's going to be Micah 6, 8. But before you go there, I was thinking about, you know, the message we also talked about how we view God really depends on how we, you know, are obedient to God. How do we view God? And we talked about that before. Do we, some people view him as some tyrant sitting up on high and, you know, and some don't see him as a loving God. Some of us don't understand mercy. And I was thinking about that this week. I was, you know, looking at what we've been studying on Wednesday nights with Sister Sylvia, and it's been such a blessing. Just encourage you guys to really um, tune in. And it's amazing how God speaks to us corporately, but he also speaks to us individually as well as we study his word. And I was thinking about, you know, some people think that God is so terrible when he corrects his people and our ancestors because of their obedience to God. They went into captivity. And God did this out of love because he loved them. He wanted to, in a sense, rebuke them, but cause them to understand that they needed God. And I know when we read it on Wednesday night, it sounds like, oh, my God, you know, God just, you know, he did this, he did that. But I was thinking, I went back through the word and I loved doing my own personal study, but I was looking at, you know, how, you know, God sent many prophets, you know, just like he does it us today. So this is today's word. You know, God just don't let us slip off. We don't just slip off into sin. God doesn't like that. He is a merciful God. He's a God that continues to warn us. He's a gracious God. He's long suffering. And I just want to bring that in your perspective. I was just studying, going back through the word, and I was looking at the groups of prophets that God brought to our ancestors, our people of God, as they supposed to have been demonstrating the glory of God, but they were off into their own sin and their own pride all into lustful things. And, you know, I was looking at how, and in my studies, I found that prophet, to the prophet Isaiah, some of these were contemporary, some of these were at, going towards the northern and southern kingdom, the 10 and the two kingdoms simultaneously. And you know, the 10 kingdoms up Top in um, Israel, they was in captivity first, and then came Judah and then the tribe of Benjamin in the southern kingdom. But the prophets, Isaiah, Judah, 
uh, to, that he sent into uh, Judah. I'm sorry, the prophets that uh, he sent into uh, Judah and, and, and Israel. <laughs> Look at Isaiah, Jonah, Amos, Hosea, Isaiah, we just said, Micah, Nahum. At the same time, these last few covered a period of 102 years. And that really blessed me because I'm like, you know, but people don't want to say God is gracious. But you know that just like I do, because look at how he tends with us today, contends with us today. S 70 year gap in between. And then the second set of prophets, you got to listen to this, Jeremiah, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Daniel, Joel. This demonstrates God's graciousness and his love. Ezekiel, Obadiah. Covered another period of 94 years, God's grace and his mercy. And that's why when you read these books, you see the same message that God was giving to all the people. Repent, turn. We're going to talk about that today, how he said that my people don't even know me. My people don't seek after me. And that word is for us today. And then he also had the other prophets. There is no, there is no minor prophets. I just had to study that, but you know, understand that. Haggai, Zechariah, they covered another seven years and then ended up in Malachi in the New Testament. But if you read this, it just blessed me because I was reading through this and I was reading books together and Micah, especially Nahum and Habakkuk. And they said the same thing, God, same thing that God gave us, that God is continually giving us his word today. As the writer said that we will hide that word in our heart. Now, just don't hide it and tuck it away and don't use it. He means that it will be forefront and center of all our decision making. So that we won't fall into the same error as our predecessors. <clears throat> because we are God chosen as well. <clears throat> and that just blessed me. Now, back in uh, Malachi, well, look, let's go back to Micah that we're going to start. And Sister Sylvia read through a lot of that and other texts as well. But, you know, it's the same thing that's happened today. The God's people, you know, and I was thinking about that. God always telling people, you know, when you get into captivity or when you take over this land, don't take up their gods. Don't take up the idols. Don't take up their ways. And I was like, you know, it's, it's kind of easy to do that. And no, to no offense, I'm just giving an example. I was looking yesterday, my wife called me and, you know, we're looking at the coordination of the monarch and all this kind of stuff. And I'm not saying anything positive or negative. This is an example. So please don't get offended. But I was looking into the crowd and I look at all these flags and all these nations that they have overcame. And I'm not going to get into that. I'm not going to get into history. But all of these cultures they indoctrinated the people to think the way they think. You had to, you know, and my, even my wife was saying in the Bahamas, you know, they taught you the songs, the same songs they were singing yesterday, Courtney, she learned those songs and you're okay with that, right? Baby, where's she at? When she was a little girl over in school, and this is when they, they indoctrinated and then they taught them how to dance. Now you in the Bahamas, you in, you in the island, different set of people, they, they a uh, lot. They made sure you adopted. They forced it upon you their culture, and it's the same thing that happened to the children of Israel. And I know we love to down them, and I'm not saying they're right or wrong. I mean they're wrong. Same thing today, but we're in a culture, and I see that today. <laughs> you know, you see that in uh, Greek and English and Roman expression and influence on our culture, even in business. And if you are not careful as a body of Christ, we will be indoctrinated. And I'm saying to myself, I'm sitting there watching people that have been enslaved and, and, and know by the ancestors and, and killed and God knows what, but they're loyal to an idea, to a man. The only problem I had with it when he bowed, bowed out, they said it was the head of the church. And I'm like, no, nah, bro, Christ the head of the church. <laughs> ain't no man can play as no head of the church on this earth. But I'm going to leave that alone because I say it's going to make it controversy. So it's not to me. But the same thing was going on with our ancestors in the book of Micah, Habakkuk, Nahum, book of Isaiah, 
that we're studying, book of Jeremiah. You see the same thing if you read about it. God's people were being indoctrinated and they were picking up the culture. And Sister Sylvia read that to us three weeks ago so beautifully. You know, the people were mistreating the people around them. Not only, they were mistreating the people of God. Now they were shrewd and they were not in a good way. They were taking advantage of people. They were stealing the lands from the widow. They, they were taking people's money. They were bribing people to get ahead. Now, this is not the world. This was, he's talking to his chosen people. He's talking to Israel. He's talking to us today. And I see that sometime in this world, even in the business world of Christians, we see, you know, in the life of us, we're, we don't adopt. We have adopted another culture instead of kingdom culture. And we do the same thing today. We look upon them and say, oh, my God, how can children of Israel, how can our ancestors do that? Well, how can we do that today? We're doing the same thing. But in getting to Micah 6, and this is the only big scripture we got to do today. Let's start reading from 1 down to 6 and what God was saying to us and his people. So in Micah, M-I-C-A-H. Chapter 6, verse 1. We're going to go down to verse 8. Verse 1 says, now this God contending, and Sister Sylvia went over this, and we went over this a couple of Wednesday nights ago. God says, hear now what the Lord says. Arise, contend, and plead your cause before the mountains. And as she said before creation, and let the healers hear your voice. <laughs> I love that. God is saying, you know, even plead to his creation. Everything cries out to him. He's God of all, all created things. And he says, hear, O mountains, the Lord's controversy and you strong and enduring foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a controversy a pleading contention with his people. And he, God, would plead or he would plead and contend with Israel. And he says, O my people, what have I done to you? This is God speaking. Same thing he said to us today. Oh, my people, what have I done to you? And in what, and in what have I wearied you? Testify against me. He said, ask to me. God asking us, say, how have you wearied us? You know, we have a problem of being obedient to him, and, and he, he, we love his blessings. We'll come to that. Verse 4. For I brought you up out of the land of Egypt and then remember you out of the house where you, sorry, and redeemed you out of the house where you were born servants. And I set before you Moses, Aaron, Miriam. And it says, oh, my people, earnestly, remember how that Balak, king of Moab, devised and what Balaam, the son of Bor, Answer him. Remember what the Lord did for you? So he called on an account. He's asking them to remember all the time that he's rescued them. And he brought them out of bondage, out of suffering, when they should have been destroyed. From Shittim and Gilgad. That you may know the righteous and saving acts of the Lord. So he didn't do it just, you know, he wanted them to know, to identify that God is a righteous, he's a saving God, even though they, just like us, don't always do right. But God said he wants us to remember, he wants us to see that he's a righteous God. He's a saving God. And then it says in six, with what shall I come before the Lord and by myself before God on high? His servant speaking. Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves, a young, a, a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for the transgression of the fruit of my body, for the sins of my soul? So he's saying here, you know, such as things that we do today, we love sacrifice. See, but obedience is bad in sacrifice. You know, God didn't want to them. Rams and bulls. I mean, if he, did, if he owned all of that, we bring him something to give him something that he already owned. But we know the type and shadow of that. And we know about the new covenant. Sister Joe 
Minister Jones already covered that. And such is the day, God don't need our sacrifices. He needs our obedience. Yes, the things that we do, <laughs> the programs and all this kind of stuff, we talked about that. But God just desires our people. This is a plain word that God just wants us to be obedient. And then in verse eight, this is our chapter for today. Now he asked God, should we bring him rams? Should we do all these things? Should we sacrifice? Should we have all these programs? Same thing for us today. And then God says this through his servant. I'm going to read it in the King James and Amplify. King James, James says, he has showed the old man, us, you and I, what is good. And what doth the law require of thee, but to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. Now, God is always, you know, people that God is confusing. God is not confusing. He's, perhaps <laughs> he's just straight to the point. Ain't no gray line. He's white, black. There ain't no in between. He just tells us if we would do this. Amplify says this. He has showed you, oh man. He has shown us what to do good. Now remember, they're living in a time like us now. People are cheating people. In the name of the Lord. You know, I was thinking back there in England stuff. They were killing everybody in the name of the king. In the name of the Lord. They said God and king. We do it. We say God and country. Ain't too much change. I'm going to leave that alone. But they were doing things in the name of God. But really for a king, such as we do today. Where does all wars come from? Man's pride and greed. He wants something, the Bible said, that he don't have. And guess what? He wanted to kill for it. But the Bible said all you got to do is ask God. He said, that's why they do that, because they don't ask God. Amplify says, he has showed you, O oh man, you and I, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you and I, but to do justly. Now, people won't do it justly right then. And to love kindness. He was reminding them the statutes and what God considered good. And mercy, loving kindness and mercy, and to humble humble. Humble you. Now you go back. What so see, prideful man, every time pride coming full fall. They were prideful. And he says to humble yourself and walk humble, humbly with your God. So today we're just going to cover this, knowing that God is a righteous God. So the first thing God asks us to. <laughs> about do good is it do just. Now, this, these goods is what God considered good. You remember, we were created, before we were created, we were created before anything is it, we were created to do the good works that God ordained for you and I and everyone. But they're God ordained good works, not what we consider good, because my good, you know, if I go out and hand somebody a $5 bill that's um, sitting on the corner, somebody that's hungry, I'm good for the day. God, I know did my good deed. I can turn around and, and talk bad to people. I, I can be prideful, but you know, I did my deed for the day. I checked that box. But God said, your righteousness, remember the word, is not good enough. Your, you and our righteousness is just 50 rags. So it says, just here, and I'm going to take my time. That's all we got to do today. Just is based on behaving accordingly to what is morally right. So just like then, in Michael's days, in the prophet days, and Michael wasn't on the prophet saying this, it was others that we just read. He said, behave yourself what is morally right. People was running around killing, sacrificing the children. They were robbing and killing, and they were taking the, the land that was uh, the, that was uh, endowed to a widow or family. They was taking people land, and they were making themselves rich and fat. We were doing that, same as we do today. And I've seen church people do it. I always got to have an angle. Don't want to fellowship just to be fellowship and get, got to get you over that house and say, man, I got this business going on and let me tell you what we could do. We could take over the world. 
Somebody want to wait for God. The original message today, which we'll get to it, and you're going to write this down. I, don't, I didn't like this message, by the way. When God is not good enough. That was the original message for today. But God said, hold on that for a minute. When God, when I, God's people say, when God is not good enough. But we're going to come back to that on another day. But what is morally right and fair? And now I looked at this. They were talking about a just and democratic society and a kingdom. But the kingdom that the word is talking about is not a kingdom that we saw on TV yesterday. He's talking about a kingdom that God reigns and his son Christ is king and we must behave ourselves according to that deity. See, the only democratic society God's got is his. He said, if you love me through his son, you will keep my commandments. That's it. <laughs> but you know everything that he does, it benefits us. Because we don't know better. So he's not talking about in the kingdom that we're in. Because now we can, we can look at things on earth and it would be, I like what Paul said, everything I can do, I can do anything, but that don't mean it's good for me to do it. I can cheat on my taxes. I can lie. You can do a lot of things. But he said, they ain't beneficial. But yeah, I know. All we got to do is pray for God to forgive us, right? Not quite that easy. Similar words of this behaving just and fair and morally right in God's, uh, compared to God's kingdom is a fair-minded, fair equitable, these words says, impartial, unbiased, neutral. I like that word. Not independent, not democratic, not Republican, but neutral see god don't have parties in his kingdom he only okay i'm about to say that later god does not have parties in his kingdom <laughs> he's the king what he says goes we don't have to vote people in but some of us in our lives i, I don't want to get to that we vote god out in our decisions we vote god we, we veto the word I don't want to do that. So we veto. Yeah, we got the right to veto. We're going to get to that too. When God is not enough. <laughs> Being unprejudiced. We read last time that God was impartial. He's nonpartisan. I don't want to get it. He's non-discriminatory. He don't look at people as being Hispanic, African-American, where you from your heritage. He's not partial. Don't want to get into that. You know, and Christ himself said, you know, they ain't know all this stuff that we've been talking about. Ain't none of that. He says the just and the unjust. They're believers and unbelievers. Ain't no Greek, Jew, all this kind of stuff. Believers, unbelievers. Either you believe in God and with him, or will it be obedient? Or even save, so saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost, or some kind of ghost that may be ruling us, we're against God. I have to say that because sometimes people come telling me what God told them to do, and it just don't sound right. It ain't quite right with the word, Brother Jones. And I have I was telling somebody that somebody came up and just gave me a word, and, and I told them I can't like, take that word. I said, not out of disrespect. I said, but that for somebody else. Because what you just told me don't line up with the word. It don't even make sense. So I, I like what you said, but it's not for me, but for somebody else. And I appreciate that. See, I did it out of respect. Did it out of love. I just figured they had a word for somebody else. Because if the word they got for me ain't in this word, it, it ain't the Holy Ghost. And Sister uh, Sylvia was talking about Sister Ann and all that stuff. Sometimes that stuff in the church. Witchcraft. But when we not following God, all this stuff slip in. Back to the message. Upright, honorable. Oh, my God. Uh, decent. I have to tell people to come off sometimes. Can you just act human? Instead of cussing somebody out, talking all bad. So can't, too much of a reset. Can you just act human? Can you act honest, decent? Right-minded. Sometimes people act like Chris and act like they're in their right mind. Straight. We're going to get in that word, but that got straight. 
not five or six sexualities, straight. And you're thinking and then you're not straight. It's okay. Everything else he says, uh, abomination is not my word. He wants us to be straight, reasonable, trust, trustworthy. I'm in this room because a gentleman said he was going to clean, do something in my house because I got some rotted boys on the back of my porch. And he's a, he's a Christian. He's a minister in his church. He owned his own business. And he didn't get to it this week. The man shows up on a Sunday morning. I said, bro, you can't work on it. He said, I got to. He said, God got on my mind. And God said, no, it's Sunday, but you got, you got a donkey in the ditch. And I promise you this week, I would do this. They're out there working. Been here since 7 30. Trustworthy. But Christians always got an excuse. But man, you know something came up. I had to go pick my pastor. Now, you know you got your pastor got three cars. <laughs> it messed with you. But they said, I always got an excuse. Lying. But the Bible said, we talked about it. He said, lie not to one another. Christians lying on each other. And think it's all right. Be truthful, sincere. I like this. Be square. You know, we used to say that when I was up. People don't use that word. Let's square up. In other words, you did something for me. Let me make it right with you. Let me give you something that's equal to what you've done to me. Not trying to get over and tell my, the Lord bless me. I saved $20 because I cheated you. He wants us to be square at one another. <laughs> the opposite of this is unjust, unfair, wrongfully behaving. Now, when I look at this justly, it's well-founded in the word of God. It means being well-founded in the word of God. You can only be, see, God is just. So in order for us to act justly, we have to be well-founded in the word of God. Because we got to understand and know what his just is, not our just. We can't make up stuff. You know, I love the part that God reveals himself to each and every one of us. And he said that you don't need a teacher. I will, my spirit in you will teach you who I am in my ways. And I'm glad he does that. Because if he didn't, we will have, how many people got, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, all these different opinions of God and what his justice looked like. But God said, wait a minute. Now nah, I'm going to teach each and every one of you what my justice is because I'm just. And since I'm inside of you, I expect you to be well grounded in the word because the word became flesh and demonstrated to you how to behave. Yes, Christ. So you have no excuse. So we can't make up nothing. Hmm. Means being valid. Sound. Well founded. I said we that well-founded in the word. You know, we get to a point that we don't know what to do in the decision. We need to go to the word of God. If you can't find it in the word, pray. His Holy Spirit will show you what it, where it is and how to find it. And if you don't need to know how to do that, you can even fast. See, some things come by fasting and praying. That's a dirty, dirty word in, in the church. <laughs> That's a cuss word right there, fast. What do you mean fast? Turn, up, buff, turn down the buffet? Fast? What's fast, though? We know went over that. <laughs> First Corinthians 15, 58. Just write it down. First Corinthians 15, 58 says, therefore, 1 Corinthians 15, 58. King James says, therefore, my beloved brother, and talk about us, be ye, you and I have to be steadfast. Oh, I love this scripture. We have to be steadfast, unmovable, no matter what people do in the land. God has told us what's right and what's just. People will teach you how to get ahead, you and I. But most of it ain't just. But the word of God says, you and I, because we're dear beloved brothers and sisters, we have to be steadfast. We have to be unmovable. Always abounding above in the work of the Lord for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. See, that's how we know that our labor is not in vain. We're not unmovable. We know the word of God. It's our foundation. We don't move from that. 
a pastor don't come on the TV and preach to us saying anything different. Next thing you know, what that brother says that they all out there in the left field because somebody done told them they need to go to another country right quick. They need to move. They need to do this. Now, if the Holy Spirit tell me to do that, I gladly pack my bag. Until the Holy Spirit tell me, I ain't going nowhere. Kind of oxymoron. God tell me that I got a work to do here, but all of a sudden somebody on TV, they tell me I need to go across the country or in another country, excuse me, across the water. So is God bipolar? Now, if it come a time that he tell me to do that, I gladly pack my bag. But I see people do that even in churches. Oh, God called me to KCM. But where you at? <laughs> what? What? Okay, I'm going to leave that alone. Like, okay, but we got to be these things, people. Next thing is he said that we have to love mercy. Now, mercy is the, we're talking about the biblical definition of mercy. We ain't talking about the mercy that we got. Because my mercy is I want to have pity and mercy on you when I feel like it, depending on how you act. So let's scratch my definition. I know your definition probably ain't too far from that, right? Your personal definition apart from the word. But the word of God, mercy appears in the Bible as, as it relates to forgiveness. Or withholding punishment. For example, God the Father showed mercy on you and I when he sacrificed his son, Jesus Christ, on the cross. To pay a price for mine and your sin. Now, that's mercy. I love what the Bible said. Yet while we were sinners. See, God didn't look at our resume. He didn't interview us. Because I know I wouldn't have passed. I, while we were yet sinners, he sent his son to die for us. See, God's mercy means his pity, but not our pity. It's that compassion. And it's that kindness towards people that you and I are supposed to be showing. Are we showing compassion and kindness toward, well, you know, brother, people out there shooting each other and they shooting each other up and they, oh, I, I, I got to be ready. And, and, I, and I, I can't just be kind to people no more. I got I to gotta make them, you know, don't want to talk to me. I got to have a mean face. I got to be tough. Yeah, we do that. Go walking outside of a house now. Don't want nobody to speak to us. But to be friendly. With, how, how you going to minister to people? People scared of us. We carrying guns out loud and open and, 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 and shotguns around our back in the back. And I'm talking about God's people. I ain't talking about the boys in the country, the bows. I'm talking about God's people. And we got to scare people now. And nobody want to come up to us. Now, I'm talking about myself, too, because y'all know I like to carry <laughs> but the God said, cut that stuff out. Now, if I'm out there in the woods and I'm out there with my wife at night and all that kind of stuff, I'm going to protect myself. But she got to wear two guns strapped on my back to scare people. Thank God. That ain't showing mercy and kindness. I don't want to talk to me. They be like, that's an angry black man. I'm going to just be real today. But God's mercy, his mercy shows up in the believer's life, in our salvation. And when God, God continues to show mercy and forgiveness toward, now I don't know about you, but God continues to show mercy and forgiveness to me. See, his mercy is unending. And the Bible says, new every morning. Great is his favor. So we're supposed to be likewise. God triumphs over judgment through his mercy. You know, God don't give us what we deserve. God even, it pleases him. Now, you ain't gonna like this. It pleases God to show mercies to his enemies. You, you, you gotta read the word we're reading it now. God shows mercy to his enemies. He even tell us to do the same. He said, somebody to spitefully use you. Y'all know what the word said, right? Cuss them out in the name of Jesus. You can just step out and just cuss them out. That's what the word say, right? <laughs> somebody to spitefully use you. You got to get, get some get back, right? The word of God said, bless them. 
I'm like, now y'all know, um, you know that ain't our mercy, and that definitely, come on. In other words, I can go over there and, and, and I, you know, y'all got examples. They ain't gonna give my example. My example kind of rough. But somebody that's spitefully used, you, you know y'all, some of y'all up there, y'all been to spitefully used before. I don't know if at job, in the military, or anywhere, but, and then God said, turn around, and you got there. Bless them? And he said, show love to them? He said, what love, what good is your love to show love for those that you know that are in the faith, but you ain't showing no love for those that ain't in the faith? Those people that don't like you. I don't like it either, y'all. I'm, I'm preaching something that I'm, I don't like either. But guess what? I'm going to be obedient to it. Show mercy towards him. The root of the word mercy in scripture in the Old Testament Hebrews, and there's plenty of words I can say. I like three. Is One is Rakim. And it means the love to love or have compassion upon. And that was in Psalms 116, 5. It says, gracious is the Lord and righteous. He's gracious and he's righteous. Yea, the Lord our God is merciful. Wow. In other words, means, you know, I had to look it up with, you know, I have time to talk about. It talks about the mercy seat. That God put a place there is a place for us to always receive forgiveness. But you know, he supplied it on the cross. In Exodus, it was a general mercy seat. But now the blood of Christ covers that. We have forgiveness of our sin. The things that we should be rightly judged for, God has mercy upon us. Psalms 18, 25 expresses the goodness and the kindness or mercifulness. I like that. With the merciful, that would show thyself merciful. With an upright man, that would show thyself upright. Now, that's our behavior. In the Greek word, elemon, E-L-E-E-M-O-N, -E -E it means to have pity upon, that's found in Matthew 5, 7. It says, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Now, that makes me want to be merciful. Because if I'm, you and I are going to obtain mercy from God, we have to show mercy. You know, so like that, uh, parable prophet said it, 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 he said that you know there was a, a, a man that owed somebody something his boss and the guy who owed him had servants but this guy's boss forgave him what he owed him but this servant that has servants he went to them and he was shrewd upon them y'all know that story he didn't show mercy. And then when that servant went back to his master, he said, wait a minute, I heard what you did. Now I'm going to give to you what you gave to them. See, God's trying to tell us something. But yet we want to always tell God to give us mercy, but we want to back harshly towards other people. But blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Another one suggests compassion upon a person. The idea of divine forbearance and showing compassion and passing over sins. And I was surprised that we find in Roman 2, sorry, Roman 12, 1, which reads, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view, I like it, in view of God's mercy. So it's urging us, not in view of our mercy, but it's urging us, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy. To offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, this is your true and proper worship. But he tells us to do this in view of God's mercy. In other words, when we look at the mercy that God has gave and given us, we ain't got no problem offering our bodies as a living. We ain't got no problem acting Towards merciful towards other people. We not, don't have a problem being in right standing and pleasing with God, which is our true worship. 
not running around the church, not speaking in tongues, but your true worship is showing mercy in view of God's mercy, being as he is. <laughs> wrote the, I wrote this out. Meaning of God's mercy is it, God's patience or his patience in action. So I know we say we got patience, but then we don't act like it. But God's patient, God's acting patient. It is God extending patience to those who deserve to be punished. I ain't talking about you, I'm talking about me. I, for the things that I've done, I deserve to be punished, but God shows mercy uh, from people like me. Mercy is not something that God owes us. Let me get that straight. God do not owe us mercy. Yeah. By definition, mercy cannot be owed. It's like grace. But it's something that God is in in kindness and grace to those who do not deserve it. And we thought God was just about us. But we call ourselves Christians and believers. God is gracious towards even the unbeliever. And he tells us to be gracious towards the unbeliever. He said, yes, be gracious to those in the house of God. But then he tells us to go outside of that. We have the ministry of reconciliation through love. That when we go out demonstrating God's mercy, God is saying we lift him up. If his concepts and precepts, his laws is being demonstrated in our life, his mercy and love, he said, I draw the men to me. That's something. We got the ministry of reconciliation, but God doing most of the work. <laughs> All he asked us to do is <laughs> just be obedient. <laughs> just like going to work and, and, and your boss said, I'm going to give you a million dollars a year to watch these things go by. And all you got to do is just, if you see one and I do it, I want you to hit the same thing I hit. The same button I push, I want you to push the same button. And I'm going to give you a million dollars a year. But you know, some people uh, don't like that button. They'll push another button. They even veto their blessing. Your boss said, if you see me being kind to people, I just want you to be kind to people. I'm giving you a million dollars a year just to walk around and be kind. All you got to do is follow me. If you see me being having peace and joy in my life, I just want you to do it. I just want you to express my opinion to others and the company and the kingdom that you work for. And I'll begin. I, I, I take care of it. But, you know, some of us, we quit them jobs. Well, I just want to express myself. He, they don't let me express. My, I'm talking about Christians. Y'all know we're on the job. We, we, we co-heirs in the kingdom. I, I just don't like what God said on that one. So, God, I got this one. And God said, no, nah, you just forfeit your pay. <laughs> no, nah, this ain't your company. This ain't your kingdom. Let's get to the last one so we can close up. Where's my time? Oh, yeah, we're going to close up nicely. <laughs> and then he asks us to be humble. If you could, go to Luke chapter 14. Humility. He asks us to be humble. I like this. Luke 14. Let's read 7 through 11. I'm going to read an Amplified if it's okay with you. He said, for he told a parable, Christ did, to those who were invited. When he noticed how they were selecting the places of honor, saying to them, he said to them this, when you are invited by someone to a marriage feast, do not recline on the chief seat or in the place of honor, lest a more distinguished person than you has been invited by him. That's the person who invited the one to the, to the wedding thing. And he who invited both of you will come to you and say, may I have the place you have taken? Then with humility and the guilty sense of impropriety, you will begin to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, he says, go and recline or sit yourself down in the lowest place so that when your host comes in, he may say to you, friend, come or go up higher. Then, then you will be 
honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. And he says this in 11, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, which means right below others who are honored or rewarded. And he who humbles himself keeps a modest opinion of himself and behaves accordingly, that person, he will be exalted, which means elevated in rank. And you can read the rest of that. He gave other examples, but he's talking about this humility here. <laughs> Say that, you know, because God, we, we misquote scripture. You know, God has made us the head, not the tail. But we got to get in line in front of everybody. Everybody owe us homage. That's the same as what I saw on TV yesterday. I saw people bow down to a man. And then I heard that man, no, 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 I'm not, and then I heard that man give an oath that he will be humble and be a servant. I'm like, yeah, that sounds like Christians, don't it? We confess our sins to God and we say, God, our life belongs to you. Then we get up and we want to be exalted. I want people to rep recognize that we're Christians. We've been redeemed. I'm holy. <laughs> but if God is holy and righteous, but he humbles himself, who are we? Now, the Bible defines humility to us as the fear of the Lord in Proverbs 22, 4. Humility, Proverbs 22, 4 says, humility is the fear of the Lord its wages, the wages of humility, are riches and honor and life. So if you want those things, you got to be humble. So like the first being last and the last being first. You're always putting yourself first. You're going to be last in God's kingdom. Why well, just we preaching this? Because just like those in Micah days, we have the same thing going on today. Humility. James 4.10 says, humble yourself before the Lord and he, God, will exalt you. That Latin word hummus, H-U-M-U-S, meaning of the earth, to be humble, to be face down in the dirt, submitting to the authority to another without personal pride. This is a Christian's proper position before the Lord. Personal pride dismissed. And it's just like having our face down to the earth. Submitting ourselves to God's ways. Not humility with your mouth, but with our actions. Humility is often characterized as genuine gratitude, a lack of arrogance, and a modest view of oneself. But the biblical definition goes beyond this. God said we're called to be humble, followers of Christ. It emphasizes on the godliness in the Bible. To be humble followers of Christ, and trust in the wisdom and the salvation of God to trust. In other words, I face it, we're trusting, we're trusting in the wisdom and the salvation of God. In other words, we're allowing God to lead us. But we love to say, hey, we are not our own. We've been bought with the price. Yes, we have. True humility is seeing ourselves as we truly are. We're redeemed, but we're fallen in sin. Without Christ, we will still be in that sin. We are helpless without God. I mean, look at our society. We don't have to read the Bible to say, look, oh God, they were so ungodly back there. People doing the same thing. Without God, we're hopeless. <clears throat> we really are. Write this down. 
Psalms 25 and 9. Psalm 25 and 9 said, he leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. In other words, you can't come to God all proud. He said, that's why you got to come like a child. And, and I like to make it, you know, simple. You, you know, when we were raising our toddlers, did your toddler walk up to you and tell him what you wanted or her what they wanted? <laughs> Even though I do see that today, I better be careful. <laughs> But, you know, you the one job, you feeding them, clothing them, and they somebody, well, this is what I want, mom and dad. These are my rules. You know, I want you to do this. I need my food cooked a certain way. Toddlers now. We're talking about three, four, five, six years old. <laughs> I do see some of that today, though. I don't know. And then people start counting. God don't count. He don't count, Kathy. You know, we done got one two, and as soon as we get to three, God, you know, that parent get to three, that child straighten out, and then turn it back, and then one, two, three, y'all see that? <laughs> Some of us do expect God to do us that way, don't we? God don't work like that. Mm. Biblical, biblical humility is founded in the nature of God. God said, I am humble. The father descends to help the poor and afflicted. We see this all in the word of God. The incarnate son embodied Jesus Christ. He humbled himself to be crucified on the cross. So the, and then even the resurrection is coupled using the meek and humble. Because he has allowed God to do that. In Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29. <clears throat> Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, write it down. It says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Some of us ain't got rest for our souls. You know, as Christians, we shouldn't have insomnia like that. We can't rest. Our mind can't rest. Sometimes we need to pray and ask God's forgiveness. Maybe we haven't always act gentle and humble. <clears throat> now, I know that's a medical dish. I'm talking about the spirit now. He said, get rest for your soul. That your mind, your will, and your emotions. Proverbs 3, 5 says, Proverbs 3, 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. That is really something. Now, I like this. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. It's an excellent summation of the biblical meaning of humility. To be humble, we must believe that God will lead us in the best way to live and avoid temptation. We must put complete trust in the Lord and not deceive ourselves with vanity or lust. We talked about that a long time ago, putting ourselves in situations where we know we ain't got no business being there, tempting God, and then God got to re rescue us. Shouldn't be there in the first place. Should have been obedient. We should lean on God's understanding, his wisdom and divinity to show us the righteous path through prayer. How do we do this? Through meditation? How do we do this? And even through fasting. If we're praying and don't get an answer, that don't mean jump out and go do what you think you want to do. I like, you know, what somebody preached. Someone, we don't like God when he said wait. But that's truly trusting in God. Because, and also our faithful practices too. To do this though, we must have the in, initial requirement of humility. To open our hearts and withdraw from the from our in, ignorance, our arrogance, and our ego. Hmm. Our ignorance and arrogance and our ego. Now, why am I talking about that? The importance of humility. The importance of humility is directly related to the deadly consequences of pride. Pride separate us from God. 
as we do not acknowledge and we do not apprehend the eternal sovereignty of our Lord. Pride separates us from God. It's the opposite of humility. Therefore, humility is important in the deep gratitude we hold in properly recognizing God, his divinity, and his love for us. Wrote this, humility importance is also found in recognizing our flawed nature in human on earth, as humans on earth, and our susceptibility to sin, if not vigilantly or uh, uh, vigilant against temptation. So 1 Peter says this. 1 Peter 5.8 says this. 1 Peter 5.8. You remember we one of those words of, of um, good and humble was also being sober, sober-minded. So 1 Peter 5 eight says this, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. See, Satan likes when we're prideful. <laughs> he loves when we let him in. Oh, you don't believe that pride can leave you in the sin, right? Oh, James, remember we studied James 1, 14 through 15? James 1, 14 through 15, but each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, and you know that's, we're enticed through our pride, you know, it gives birth to sin and sin when it's full grown, bring forth death. So the consequences of pride is death. When we show God, we act like we know better. <clears throat> Now, I'm going to give you a few other scriptures and we're done. Humility is frequently mentioned in scripture that relate to our salvation in Jesus Christ. Christ gives us a great summary of what being humble in our relationship to God. Number one, to enter God's presence, we must come humbly to the throne. We saw that, 1 Peter 5, 6. God says the meek shall inherit the earth. We saw that. I'm just summarizing. Matthew 5, 5. The proud are cast down and will not be humble. Uh, sorry, they'll be cast down and will be humble before God. Sorry, James 4, 10. <laughs> and I had to look up because Pastor Stan was talking about uh, our suffering. It says when we, we are humbled or even or even when we suffer, we need to remember we will ultimately reign with Christ. And that's in 2 Timothy 2.12. He uses sometimes suffering to make us humble. <clears throat> I got to read these last two. Philippians 2, 3 through 11. Philippians 2, 3 through 11. It says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather in humility, value one another above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance of a man or as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God has ordered him to the highest place. Remind me, remind you of the, uh, the parable we just read. <laughs> Therefore, God has ordered him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledges that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of, Father, of, of, glory of God the Father. That was Philippians 2, 3.
three other scriptures I can read, but I want to go and close out. So back at Micah 6, verse 8. He showed you and I, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you and me? He says that he wants us to do justly. Even in this world and what's going on and everything that we're going to see, he wants us to be just. He wants us to love mercy. And he wants us to walk humbly and acknowledge him as our God. To do this, you and I must submit to God in everything and every way and have faith in him, allowing him to become our savior, listen closely, and our Lord. Not just our savior, but also he's our Lord. That Jesus gave us example. He said, I speak and do what I see my father seek and do and what he tells me to because we don't want to be like in Wednesday night in Isaiah 1 when Sister Green was reading this <laughs> Isaiah 1 he said listen O heavens pay attention earth this is what the Lord says the children I raised and cared for and rebelled they have rebelled against me even an ox knows its own. Y'all remember we read that? And a donkey recognizes master's care. But my people, they don't know its master. My people don't recognize my care for them. Oh, what a sinful nation they are. Loaded down with a burden of guilt. There are evil people, corrupt children, who have rejected the Lord. They have despised the Holy One of Israel and turned their backs on him. We don't want that to be our testimony, but yet we confess Christ. And I'm going to leave you with this last scripture. So write that down, Micah 6, 8. But I want you to write this down in conjunction. 2 Chronicles 7, 14. Not going to have time to express this, but the Holy Spirit will take you through it. Love this scripture. Second Chronicles 7, 14, one of my favorites. If my people. He didn't say the president. He didn't say Congress. He didn't say those who call themselves deity. <laughs> but he says, my people that knows me and should know me that call me and a call by my name. He said, shall humble themselves, you and I, and pray. I'm okay with a national day of prayer, but God said, we got to pray. I'm okay with a prayer march, but I've seen so many prayer marches. I'm talking about the ones I've been in, in this city, and it seemed like to me the city got worse. Because we call the mayor and the city council and somebody, I'm not saying they saved unsaved. That's not my job. But we're trying to get everybody else saved and get them to do something. But God said, no, if my people that should know me, that call me by name and I call them by name, if those people should pray, if they will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. And then he said that we have to turn from our wicked way. Now, our wicked ways is ways that we do that just ain't godly. Now, you know. I was talking about those practices on this earth. We can get away with them, but they ain't godly. And you don't need nobody to teach you that either. I don't have to go through that with you. You already know because the Holy Spirit convicts you every time you do it. But he said, if we would turn away from our way, wicked ways, he said, then will I, God, will hear. He ain't going to hear everybody else cry, but he said he's going to hear his people cry. And I will forgive their sins and will heal their land. So what does God require of us? What does he consider good? To do justly, 
to love mercy and walk humbly with the Lord. Now, days to come, and you know you we live out here in this earth, that may be sometimes difficult to do. But God does not want us to be indoctrinated and practice the thing that's in this earth that some people will actually call godly, but ain't in the word of God. So people now these days, they will go against you and say something evil against you. And they'll say God told them to. But that ain't in the word. To remember, God wants us to be steadfast, unmovable, so that we can abound. And I know sometimes it's hard to be humble. It's hard to show mercy. But we as God's people, we don't do it. And I know this world is changing. But God don't have us to here to be hard. And all yeah, our faces so disfigured, we go out, people don't want to talk to us. God wants us to be approachable. When you do things that work, that are honorable, yeah, people going to look at you like, you know, you ain't had to do that. And yeah, I did, because I represent a kingdom that is controlled by my God, my Lord, and my Savior. And I must treat you fairly. Even the people at work and in your neighborhood that you don't like, he wants to be just and fair with them. So let us walk humbly, humbly before the Lord, understanding that his word, his wisdom, and his word is right. And it's the only thing is going to lead us in the right relationship with him. Simple word for the day. But in this world that we live in, we need some humble people. We need some loving people. We need some people that we can see the attributes of God. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word. And Father God, we pray, I pray that we are obedient to your word, Father God, that we will walk humbly before you, Father God. We will do what is just and we will love mercy. We'll walk humbly before you, Father God. Help us, Father God, to demonstrate your kingdom on this earth. Help us, Father God, to redeem others to you by our actions, not by what we say, but what we do, what we have become. That we love others enough, Father God, that we desire them to have a relationship with you. Therefore, we'll humble ourselves and bow down before your word and your wisdom so that they can experience your salvation, that they can see your love your mercy, and your grace demonstrated in the lives of your people. We thank you, Father God. Be with us as we go out, Father God, and pray that you will continue to lead people to us every day that need you, Father God, and need to see you in us, Father God, and not ourselves. Father God, I ask you, Lord, just as your Holy Spirit within us, that it will help us to just destroy that prideful relationship that we have with self and depending on what we want to do and how we want to do it. But Father God, we don't want to be allow that to lead us into sin, which is separation from you, Father. We thank you. We honor you. We thank you for your word. Continue to bring revelation that word all week long and throughout our life. In your precious holy name we pray. Amen.